very warm welcome students uh, today we shall study about uh, dietary management of liver diseases uh, this is part of uh, your msc dfsm course msn005 therapeutic and clinical nutrition so as we all know uh, liver diseases are concerned uh, basically with the liver and the gall bladder and certain organs associated with liver and gall bladder so typically we shall discuss today the major diseases associated with the structure and the functioning of the liver uh, i hope you must be remembering that liver is uh, the most uh, important organ of our uh, body it is uh, it weighs about 1500 grams and uh, it is its structure as you can see in the slide its structure has a right lobe and a left lobe if you can see here and uh, the liver is supplied with blood through a portal vein uh, through the hepatic artery and a portal vein can you see the next slide now uh, our liver performs almost 500 functions and uh, therefore the liver is uh, often called the power house of human body the major functions of liver include metabolism of carbohydrates protein and fat storage activation and transport of several vitamins and minerals formation and excretion of bile and therefore it has an important role with the proper absorption of fat conversion of ammonia to urea and soon we will be discussing how this important function of liver if not performed properly can result in diseases such as cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy metabolism of steroids detoxification and selective filtration let's come on to the next slide whenever we have to assess a patient as to what kind of a liver disease the patient is suffering from and how severe the disease is because that is the major crux behind which the major foundation behind which we shall determine as to which nutrients should we restrict or provide in adequate quantities or above the rdi for a particular patient who is entering into a clinic or is hospitalized so the major liver function test that must be remembered include those of hepatic excretion these include the total serum bilirubin which includes the direct and the indirect bilirubin then comes the serum bile acids the urine bilirubin and the urobilinogen apart from the hepatic ex excretion tests we have the cholecystasis tests these include serum alkaline phosphatase a very popular test then we have leucine aminopeptidase five nucleotidase and gamma glutamyl transpeptidase if you see the next slide we have certain other tests which are tests of hepatic enzymes these include sgpt sgot which you must be very familiar with them then we have serum lactate dehydrogenase there are also tests which help us in analyzing and estimating the serum proteins which are being synthesized by the liver and these are indicative for instance the prothrombin time then we have the serum albumin serum globulin partial thromboplastin time mitochondrial antibody anti nuclear and smooth muscle antibodies coming over to the next slide there are certain miscellaneous liver tests which become important in identifying a specific liver disease or a deficiency of a particular nutrient because of liver malfunction such as serum ferritin this is particularly important in case of liver cirrhosis we have ammonia it is important of course as we know for liver cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy then we have alpha antitrypsin ceruloplasmin alpha fetoprotein and specific tests for viral hepatitis uh, the tests for viral hepatitis are very frequently done to find out whether it is the liver disease is because of an infection or it is a non infectious cause now some of the most common liver disorders we which we come across most frequently include the hepatitis the fatty liver liver cirrhosis encephalopathy hepatocellular carcinomas there are 
several of them, I am just grouping them together, hepatic amoebiasis, then we have cholestatic liver diseases, vascular disorders of liver, Ray's syndrome, hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, alpha antitrypsin deficiency. Now these last three ones, hemochromatosis, Wilson's and alpha antitrypsin deficiency, these three are inherited, autoimmune disorder. Then liver diseases may not always be alone, they may occur because of a complication to certain other disorders occurring in our body such as the rheumatoid arthritis, polymegalia, polyarteritis, Sedan syndrome, jejunoelial bypass, steatohepatitis which is often caused by common diseases or disorders of human body such as obesity, diabetes or long term uh, when the patient is put for, on a, for long term on parenteral nutrition. Today we shall be discussing three major diseases. These include hepatitis, cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy which are part of your uh, major part of your syllabi. Hepatitis as we all know the most common liver disorder is an inflammation of the liver characterized by diffuse or patchy necrosis. Major causes are specific hepatitis virus, alcohol and drugs. Less common causes include other viral infections uh, and it could be because of leptocyprosis. It may also be chronic or autoimmune in nature. Now, hepatitis can be of several types, uh, but we majorly uh, classify them or categorize them into acute hepatitis and chronic hepatitis. What generally or how can we define acute hepatitis? It is diffuse liver inflammation, which is caused by specific hepatotropic viruses that have diverse modes of transmission and epidemiologies. I think you must be very much aware of hepatitis A and hepatitis B. It may occasionally progress to acute hepatic failure. The major symptoms include, uh, or the, we can divide them into uh, majorly into four phases. The prodormal phase, which initiates or remains uh, for about one to two days, maximum till three days. This is fever, arthalgia, arthritis rash and angioedema, the beginning of the abnormalities in the human body. Then comes the pre-icteric phase. This includes general malaise, fatigue, myalgia, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, dysgeusia, dysomia that is sleeplessness, epigastric pain. Thereafter we have the major uh, disease when the symptoms become very severe and we call the major symptom as jaundice. So we need to here remember that jaundice is not a liver disease but it is a symptom common to almost all liver diseases. Jaundice actually refers to when a patient has above normal serum bilirubin levels because the remnants of RBC cannot be excreted through the normal route due to liver malfunction and hence there is yellowness of the sclera of the eyes, the skin, there are clay colored stools and pale yellow or deep yellow to orangish yellow colored urine excretion. Thereafter is the rehabilitation or the recovery phase which is known as the convalescent phase. This includes uh, mildness of symptoms associated with jaundice and other symptoms such as malaise, fatigue, weakness, weight loss, these all begin to reduce and there is gradual recovery of the patient. At this time, if proper nutrition is provided and proper medications are provided to the patient on time, we can almost always prevent the possibility of future progression of liver diseases. If this is not handled properly, at the proper time, then it results or it can result into a chronic liver dysfunction. Next, we have chronic hepatitis. We call a hepatitis to be chronic in nature when more than six months the 
a person is suffering from symptoms associated typically of liver dysfunction. So we can define it as a hepatitis which commonly occurs due to hepatitis B and C virus or because of autoimmune mechanisms and drugs. Many patients have no history of acute hepatitis and the first indication is discovery of asymptomatic aminotransferase elevations. It is, this is important to remember because when you will see the clinical reports, you will find this level to be elevated. Others may indicate cirrhosis or its complications. Now, chronic hepatitis may occur because of several reasons. Major symptoms will vary according to the cause, but I have cons consolidated a few as to what are the major causes of chronic hepatitis. Some are very common such as malaise, anorexia, fatigue. These will alter or reduce the food intake. Then there will be low grade fever. This will increase the basal metabolic rate and therefore the energy requirements will be begin to increase. Then there will be upper abdominal discomfort. This reduces the food intake and it also affects the digestion and absorption of food. Jaundice may generally be absent. There is elevated amino transferase. ALT is generally found to be higher than AST. Splenomegaly, spider navy, palmar arrhythmia, cholestasis and anemia may be found in certain chronic hepatitis. Now next most common one and a little difficult to handle for a nutritionist is liver cirrhosis. As you can see in this figure, uh, there are two diagrams indicating of the liver. One is of a normal liver structure, another is of a cirrhotic liver, which is very clearly indicating that uh, when the liver becomes inflamed and normal functional hepatic tissues are replaced by non-functional connective tissues, they appear as scar tissues of fibrotic orange colored nodules on the surface of the liver. A very characteristic identifying feature that the patient is suffering from liver cirrhosis. Now the major symptoms of liver cirrhosis uh, can be divided into the external physical examination of the patient and those uh, associated with the metabolism of the body. Of course we cannot divide them into two uh, with a line because whatever external symptoms will appear in the patient are ultimately the result of the metabolic dysfunction in the body. Um, when we examine the patient externally, physical examination will clearly indicate ascites. There will be asterixis. The patient will not be able to speak properly. There may be a flappering tremor in the speech. There is alopecia. There is easy bruising on the surface of the skin, caput medusa, edema, then there is icteric sclera, jaundice, muscle wasting, palmar arrhythmia, spider angioma, testicular atrophy, etc. Now certain uh, symptoms here that I have mentioned, for example, palmar arrhythmia, spider angioma, these are associated with rupturing of the veins. The veins become weak and they are easily, they easily get ruptured and are the cause of bleeding in liver cirrhosis patients. The internal symptoms include, of course, as, I, as we discussed in our previous slide, there are fibrotic liver tissues on the surface of the liver which indicate that the liver cells are not functional or less functional or less efficiently functional. There is esophageal varicose portal hypertension, then there is hepatorenal syndrome. This is associated with portal hypertension when the circulation of liver is not normal. There will be neurological changes, tea colored urine, clay colored stools, massive fat malabsorption that is steatoria, glucose alterations, malnutrition, osteopenia. So all these symptoms, if you put them together, are basically neurological associated with the GI tract and those associated with malnutrition. Now next comes as to what is hepatic encephalopathy. If cirrhosis is not treated properly, it can progress to hepatic coma or hepatic encephalopathy. Encephalopathy literally means dysfunction of the brain or nervous system. When there is dysfunction of the brain or nervous system, 
because of a hepatic or a liver disorder we call it as hepatic encephalopathy this is a type of end stage liver disease characterized by degenerative changes in the brain and nervous system due to failing detoxification function of liver causing accumulation of ammonia in blood it often is associated with bypassing of hepatic circulation this is very important because this is the major reason why hepatic encephalopathy patients often have elevated blood ammonia levels ammonia is not converted to urea and we all know ammonia is toxic to our brain now there are four stages wherein we can identify a patient for the severity of hepatic coma or we can classify the symptoms into four stages stage 1 includes mild confusion agitation irritability sleep disturbances decreased attention these symptoms are very similar to those of severe liver cirrhosis and often severe liver cirrhosis progresses into a mild hepatic coma stage 2 includes lethargy disorientation inappropriate behavior and drowsiness stage 3 includes that the patient will be very lazy somnolent but when we will touch the patient or ask something he or she would be arousable whatever the patient will speak will not we will not be able to comprehend it properly the patient's behavior will be very confused and aggressive because of inability to communicate efficiently stage 4 includes severity of these symptoms and ultimately death because of when ammonia has entered brain in large levels and has interfered with the normal functioning of the brain causing severe neurological symptoms now when a patient comes to us suffering from a liver disorder Uh, the major objective of a nutritionist is to treat the patient properly so that the progression of the liver disease is attenuated and if feasible we are able to regress the disease this is uh, actually a challenge when liver disease becomes more severe in nature and it when it gets converted into liver cirrhosis and encephalopathy hepatitis is comparatively easier to handle and is less challenging to the field of nutrition now when a patient comes to you how will you analyze that the patient is suffering from how severe the liver disease is or how will you identify that what should be his nutrient requirements for this we have uh, developed a subjective global assessment tool if you can see on the slide it has certain major uh, a uh, features or characteristics if which if if they are taken care of they can easily identify we can easily identify that the patient is suffering from these particular features or characteristics or symptoms and therefore the patient is suffering from such and such severity of a particular liver disease for instance if we have the case file we can observe the weight changes this becomes very important and very challenging because liver cirrhosis patients can have ascites and edema so when there is ascites and edema it is very difficult to identify or to calculate the actual body weight of the patient because there will be fluid retention hence if we can find out from the caretakers from other family members what used to be the usual body weight of the patient prior to suffering from x liver disease it becomes very useful to identify the degree of malnutrition if it has happened in the patient but we must ensure that we do not ask the patient to step on a weighing scale when he is suffering from ascites and edema because we will come across a wrong weight of the patient this can be accompanied by identifying whether the patient is eating appropriately properly in large in adequate quantity or not are there any taste changes is there any change in the satiety because many liver patients do not feel hungry they have change in taste sensations and therefore they do not feel they have a low appetite and that could be a cause of malnutrition uh, 
uh, a dietary recall particularly a 24 hour dietary recall can be very helpful and we also need to know whether there is persistent GI problem particularly diarrhea because even if the patient is eating properly and there is malabsorption it can very often result in malnutrition in the patient then we can see physically we can examine the patient particularly the arms and the legs and the, the neck portion will clearly indicate whether there is muscle wasting how much is the adipose tissue store we can do the skin fold thickness if we have adequate uh, expertise over this and we almost we sh must see whether the patient is suffering from ascites and edema then through the clinical reports we should find out what are the major existing symptoms based on this we should nutritionally rate the patient into the following three categories whether the patient is well nourished moderately malnourished or severely malnourished most of the liver patients suffer from malnutrition though it is of various degrees so when a patient suffers from malnutrition it majorly is because of anorexia maldigestion or malabsorption steatorrhea is a major problem early satiety dysquasia doesn't feel like eating doesn't feel the food is palatable there is nausea vomiting altered metabolism and there are restricted diets of course for liver cirrhosis and hepatic coma patients so what would be the nutrient requirements this remains a challenge because for every patient it will be different and we all as as we have always suggested in your course we should never develop a single diet chart for all the patients it should be a patient centered approach so the nutrient requirements are basically for macronutrients are dependent upon the energy requirements of the patient all liver patients have elevated resting energy expenditure that means a high basal metabolic rate which is directly associated with increased rate of catabolism that means destruction of the liver cells and other cells of the body there is repletion of glycogen stores required in order to protect the liver we need to spare the proteins for regeneration of liver cells and promote weight gain if the patient is malnourished otherwise there are severe complications arising due to ketogenesis now the major energy the major part of the energy which is provided to the liver patient is through carbohydrates because that is the safest and the most well absorbed nutrient but it does not mean that we keep on overfeeding the patient with carbohydrates because we all know that simple carbohydrates would be much easily absorbed by the patient uh, but at the same time if we overfeed the patient with carbohydrates it can result in certain complications these complications i have enlisted below are basically associated more commonly seen in liver cirrhosis patients contraindications of overfeeding with carbohydrates especially glucose would include glucose intolerance because there are alterations in hormones such as insulin glucagon cortisol and epinephrine hence if we provide tube feeding to the patient it is imperative that we provide a mixed formula to the patient there can be hypoglycemia in acute hepatitis and after alcohol consumption hence this point becomes very important if there is an ambulatory patient and is habitual of consuming alcohol another important feature that we must remember is that during liver failure there is reduced glucose production and peripheral glucose utilization there is preference for lipids and amino acids as a source of energy lipids and amino acids when they are used as a source of energy cause serious malfunctioning of the body because lipid malabsorption will cause will cause diarrhea and amino acids when they are broken down in the body will result in elevation of ammonia in case of hepatic coma next important nutrient is the protein protein requirements have always been challenging and have been subject to massive and intensive research in india and all over the world it becomes more challenging for advanced liver disease whereas for ascites we all, always know 
that the most important objective is to help the patient in regenerating the lost liver cells. Hence, for hepatitis patient, we provide about 1.5 to 2 grams per kg body weight. In cirrhosis, we provide a little lesser amount of protein. Earlier, the liver, the, in liver cirrhosis, protein restriction used to be very severe. But gradually, research has indicated that too much protein restriction results in losses or breakdown of tissue proteins in the body, which can also result in uh, contribution towards the blood ammonia levels. Thus, to maintain nitrogen, and nitrogen balance and prevent chances of impending coma, as well as to help the patient in recovering from certain uh, degenerative changes occurring in the body, such as sepsis, infection, GI bleeding, anemia, wasting, we need to provide some amount of protein. In hepatic encephalopathy, on the other hand, protein restriction becomes a little more severe. This is about 0.5 gram per kg body weight, but we need to adjust for the ascites in edema. Whenever we say per kg body weight, it refers to weight without edema and ascites. The objective behind providing an X amount of protein during hepatic encephalopathy is to control or prevent further elevation of blood ammonia to meet basal protein requirements to prevent endogenous protein breakdown, subsequent malnutrition and associated complications. Now what type of a protein should be provided? When it comes to hepatitis, we can provide uh, high biological value proteins and a variety of proteins. When we say high biological value proteins, so the best one would be egg protein, the reference protein followed by milk, then we have good ones such as soya protein, that is soya bean. Now we have in the market whey protein, which is easy to digest and very good. Uh, it has a very high amount of uh, essential amino acid content. So, so forth, we can provide a variety, both vegetarian proteins and animal proteins to, the, to a patient who is suffering from hepatitis. But when it comes to severe liver cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy, then the question arises as to what should be our primary objective. Providing X amount of amino acids to build muscles, uh, to build liver tissues, and to replete all the, uh, the reserves of the body associated with amino acids, or to survive the patient till recovery is feasible. So research has largely been conducted to identify that branch chain amino acids are tolerated much better over aromatic amino acids. Why are branch chain amino acids tolerated better? Because they enhance the uptake of aromatic amino acids by muscles. They increase protein synthesis in muscles. They increase hepatic protein synthesis. They reduce cerebral aromatic amino acid levels by competing for a common transport system across the blood-brain barrier. This fourth point is very important because it will help in attenuating or reducing the severity of neurological symptoms arising in hepatic coma patients. Now we can see here which amino acids should commonly be altered in liver diseases. As you can see, the aromatic amino acid should be altered or should be avoided. That is tyrosine, phenylalanine, free tryptophan. Branch chain amino acids should be given adequately. These include valine, leucine, isoleucine. Then there are certain amino acids which increase the ammonia level in the blood to a great extent, such as glycine, serine, threonine, glutamine, histidine, lysine, aspargine, and methionine. Methionine is particularly important because it is an essential amino acid. Now, from where will we get good amount of branch chain amino acids and what should we avoid in the patient's diet to restrict aromatic amino acids? Generally, research has indicated that mixed protein diets are better tolerated. 
vegetable or plant proteins as well as casein is always better tolerated over animal protein particularly meat protein plant proteins are low in methionine and ammoniogenic amino acids but rich in branch chain amino acids the high fiber content of a plant protein diet may also be beneficial this is particularly so in case of hepatic encephalopathy patients next comes another important nutrient that is fat because fat myelabsorption is very high in all liver disorders there is severe to mild steatorrhea in most uh, patients suffering from liver diseases but we cannot restrict the fat to a great extent if we are restricting also the protein and we must also remember that fat in addition to being a very rich source of energy it makes the food nutrient dense and palatable and when a patient is anorexic and there is myalgia it is important to give good amount or at least adequate amount of fat to the patient but what amount type of fat should we give that is emulsified fat and medium chain triglycerides now from where to get medium chain triglycerides you can get them in the form of nutrition supplements available easily in the market from a chemist or liquid mcd supplements approximately when you plan a diet you must remember that about 15 ml of liquid mct would provide approximately 115 kilo calories of energy thus when we plan a diet for a cirrhotic patient or those suffering from encephalopathy they can be given liquid mcts instead of simply using visible sources of any type of fat now the next important part of the diet would be uh, finding out which vitamins need to be given adequately generally you would observe that there is deficiency of almost all fat and water soluble vitamins how can you identify here are a few symptoms which you will you will be able to see in the patient and why do vitamin deficiencies occur they occur because of steatorrhea that is malabsorption or diarrhea drugs and alcoholism okay and here we can find that if a patient is suffering from dermatitis night blindness osteomalacia edema peripheral neuropathy or there is excessive or easy bleeding as i discussed with you that the person begins to bleed easily in cirrhosis then it is an indication of deficiency of fat soluble vitamins then we have water soluble vitamins b6 you would be easily able to see mucous membrane lesions these are important uh, for uh, finding out whether the patient would in future or is is the patient at a risk of suffering from infections b12 is particularly important in case of severe cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy because it is associated with the deficiency is associated with cns dysfunction folate is associated with anemia and irritability niacin with dermatitis inflammation of mucous membrane and thiamine with neuropathy and central nervous system dysfunction then we have certain minerals uh, the deficiency of which may make a particular liver disease more aggressive these mineral deficiencies are seen more frequently among liver cirrhosis and hepatic encephalopathy encephalopathy patients these include zinc magnesium iron and phosphorus zinc of course becomes very important because nowadays lot of studies are being done on zinc and selenium as they are associated with wound healing protein synthesis and immunodeficiency then we have of course iron deficiency would be very common whenever there is capillary fragility and there is gi bleeding important electrolytes and fluids are the sodium potassium and associated with these two electrolytes is the fluid intake of the patient since patient suffering from ascites and edema therefore it is important that we monitor their serum sodium and potassium levels sodium intake can be anything ranging from 500 mg per day in severely restricted diets to 1.5 to 2 grams per day if the patient is being given diuretics or is able to tolerate diuretics diuretics would be given only if the patient is suffering from edema and ascites we generally avoid a 500 mg per day restriction 
because it makes the food highly unpalatable. If there is sodium restriction, there would be a need to restrict table and cooking salt, all preserved food, baked products, non-vegetarian food items, egg yolk, certain legumes and certain green leafy vegetables. Fluid intake needs to be monitored carefully and this will depend upon the formula given on the slide which is directly related to the basal losses and the urine output in previous 24 hours. Actually, from research point of view, it would be much more feasible or accurate to do it from the level of ascites and edema, but practically it is not feasible, therefore I have given this formula today. Now, there are certain nutritional factors on which research is being carried out. These include omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids have been found to be protective for the liver. So, these can be utilized by the normal population as well as those who have mild liver disease or when it comes to a situation of choosing an enteral or parenteral nutrition for severe liver disease patients who are non-ambulatory. From where you will get them? Fish, fish oils, flax, flaxseed oil and walnuts. A uh, good thing is that we are finding milk thistle to be uh, protective against liver diseases. It has also been found to be useful in patients who are suffering from mild to moderate liver disorders because milk thistle contains a substance known as silmarin. It stimulates production of antioxidant enzymes and regeneration of new liver cells. Nowadays in, uh, in India also we are finding research studies being conducted in identifying the effect of probiotics that means beneficial bacteria, bacteria or other microorganisms which can help in protecting or alleviating or reducing the severity of symptoms associated with diarrhea that is steatoria of liver diseases. Now how will you provide the food to the patient? It depends upon the condition of the patient. Oral feeding is the best. Next we have enteral. It can be given alone or it can be combined with oral. There are certain studies which have indicated that nocturnal feeding of enteral tube feeding has been found to be much more beneficial in improving the nutritional status of the patient. How can we assess the PUC score is the best one. The parenteral nutrition is opted the least because it is not good ultimately for the small intestine and the uh, in parenteral nutrition generally is opted for hepatic encephalopathy or end stage liver disease patients. We must always remember that parenteral nutrition should not be an option of choice. It should be only given when the patient cannot tolerate whatsoever enteral nutrition because it is not friendly to the gastrointestinal tract and whatever we may do, parenteral nutrition is hardly ever as nutritionally balanced as can be enteral and to go backward, the best would be oral feeding that is using natural foodstuffs. Okay. So, I hope this particular briefing on liver diseases would be useful to you in planning practical diets for the patient but please remember that these are only the principles of dietary management. You cannot ever say that what is good for A patient would always prove to be good for B patient. That is, if you have planned a diet for a particular patient of a particular gender, height, weight or X severity of diseases, it may not always prove to be beneficial to another patient because parameters be begin to change for every patient differently. So plan, have a patient-centered approach whenever you are planning a diet. Good luck. Thank you.